We studied our enemy. It was a huge game of cat and mouse. We knew their tactics, we knew their coded words, their coded letters. Kind of thrilling to, to be playing that game of cat and mouse. So this incompetent captain befriended a Mexican mafia member. This captain pretty much gave full control and power to the inmate to run the yard. The whole system's corrupt. The system is corrupt from the top down. Like, I'm getting the hell out of here. Right, I'm jumping ship. Then my dad was a prison guard in Southern California at the prison by our, by our home. So, you know, he was making good money. I believe when I was nine years old is when he became a correctional officer. So, you know, he started making the good money. We started taking trips to Disneyland and, and Hawaii and stuff like that. And um, I said, you have to be 21 years old to apply for the California Department of Corrections. Well, at 17 to 21, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get in trouble. If, if I don't do something wise with my time in between seven, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to, you know, screw up. And just because I had that personality, um, you know, not a not a troublemaker, just very mischievous and like kind of rebellious. Right. Um, so that was a goal to do to do three years in the army, get out when I was 21 and then join the California Department of Corrections. Unfortunately. There was a two-year hiring freeze at that time frame, meaning they were not accepting applicants. They were not. Um, so from the year 2005 to 2006, man, I went into this dark, dark hole of isolating, substance abuse, drinking. Um, mental health was not a thing back then. It wasn't spoken about. It was reflected as, as being weak to even show something like that. But I mean, eventually the, you're saying they hired you, the, there was the, the freeze was up and you, you got the hired. The freeze was right? up. So, uh, I actually did a beer run with some of my friends during that break in time. And I got sent to jail, man. I went to the, our local County jail for one week. Um, what, what do you, a beer run. They don't arrest you for a beer run. A beer run, man. <laughs> what does that mean? You just went and picked up some beer. No, stole the beer. Oh, okay. That's, um, bad. So a beer run to me is you go to the supermarket and you pick up some beer and bring it back. This beer run, beer nice. run was, uh, <laughs> it was three of us hanging out, drinking, and we ran out of alcohol. And like I said, man, I was wilding out during this period of time. And there was a driver, a passenger, and I was just chilling in the back seat. Yeah, I was accomplished, right? I'm with them, you know. And uh, the dude right. runs out of the truck, goes into the 7-Eleven, comes running back out with a case of like an 18-pack of beer, man. Um, unfortunately, right. or fortunately, however I want to look at it, the dude jumped in the bed of the truck right in front of a CHP officer. So they immediately pulled us over. And since Brawley's a small town, they ain't got much going on. They charged us with commercial burglary <laughs> for an 18 pack of beer. So I went right. to jail. It was like a Thursday, man. It was like a Thursday. I thought they were going to release us. That was my first time I've been to jail. And you know, I've been to jail three times in my life. Um, all, all alcohol related. Um, you know, I don't know. I no longer drink. I have 13 years of sobriety. But uh, this was back then. Needless to say, Friday was a holiday. Saturday, Sunday was a weekend. Monday was like a holiday. Tuesday and then Wednesday, they freaking kicked us out. Right. Uh, what are they called? Time served or whatever. But while I was in jail. But you don't get up. Right. I was going to say, you didn't, you didn't end up with a felony. Or no, no, no. They, it, it got dropped, but however, while I was in jail, there was those pay phones on the wall, and, and I called my dad, and he's like, "Hey, man, you got a letter from the California Department of Corrections to go take your to go take your oh. test." And he's like, "I don't even think you could get in right now with what you have going on." So I was like, "Damn!" So I hung up the phone. Like I said, I get out of jail. The following day, I go to Rancho Cucamonga and take the examination, and I pass the examination, the written examination. So it was just a couple months after that is when I had my background investigator. He was a sergeant for the department. And I disclosed, hey, uh, you, you have to disclose it. If not, it would be omitting. Yeah. Hey, I got, I, I was, have you ever been to jail? Yeah. So the guy's reading. He's like, wait a minute, man. It says you were here in jail a couple months ago. What's up with that? I'm like, hey, sir, I could explain everything. He's like, please do. It's like, hey, I got out of the army. I went back to my old habits, hanging out with the wrong crew. And like, I got caught. You know, I, I made a mistake. He's like, all right, kid, I believe you. I'll give you a chance. And thankfully, he gave me a chance, man. So I ended up joining the California Department of Corrections 
at the young ripe age of 22 in the year 2006. Okay. Then I go to it. And how, how do they, yeah, I was going to say, how does that happen? Are they trained? So I go to an academy. I didn't realize this then. There was only one academy at the time, which was Galt. Galt is in Sacramento, California or near there. Everybody goes to that academy. However, I guess they were having a max influx of applicants. I guess once they, re once they lifted the freeze, they had so many that they opened up another academy in Stockton, California. Well, the, the academy that I went to happened to be in Stockton. That happened to be an old female prison that was uh, no longer being used. So us, we slept in the cells. We slept in the old female prison cells. We, we showered in the housing unit. We lived in the housing unit. You know, to me, it wasn't a big deal because I had just gotten out of jail. I was kind of used to, you know, oh, so I was kind of. And then prior to that, um, I was in the army where we were sleeping on the floor. You know, the mud, the dirt, the snow. So I, it was not that bad of a stay for me. It was 16 weeks of learning policy and procedure and the law. Okay. And then you get an assignment? I did get an assignment that was at the same exact prison that my dad worked at. That's Sentinella State Prison. That's Was he, he was still, still there? there? He was still there. He was a CO. Okay. So it was kind of cool, man, in the aspect of, you know, every little kid wants to know what their dad does at work or bring your kid to work day or, hey, I wonder what my dad does. You know, you kind of look up to that father figure, literally. And on numerous occasions, I had the opportunity to work with him. Um. 2006, 2007 was a different time frame in the California Department of Corrections. Um, at the time, you had the major prison organization, the prison gang, their, their leaders for the Mexican Mafia, the Nuestra Familia, the Aryan Brotherhood, and the Black Gorilla family. They were all in the SHU, segregated housing unit, in uh, Pelican Bay and in Corcoran. Um, they were on lockdown 23 hours a day one hour out to a concrete yard and they had been there for 20 years. So it was a different time, 20 to 30 years. It was a different time frame because you had the leaders of the gangs in a box. You, you had the right. soldiers there at the time there was 33 prisons in California. The te they all, they all, you know, one hand talks to the next it, it, that I don't know how it works in other States, but you know, they all move in unity when it comes to the gangs, the gangs. And right. uh, you had you had the soldiers of their gangs, you know, doing riots, 200 man riots, 300 man riots, you know, and I participated as a, I had to quell it with a baton, with pepper spray, with the grenades, shooting the 40 millimeter less lethal wooden baton rounds. A lot of attempted murders, a lot of attempted murders with weapons. That'll usually look like two suspects armed with good, good homemade weapons, knives, man. Look like a kitchen knife stabbing the dog, you know what, out of a out of another inmate and attempting to take their life. Hey, this is Matt Cox. I'm putting out a credit course. I'm going to create this course in order to help you legally build your credit so that you can have as much borrowing capacity as is legally possible. If you're interested in the course, go to the description box, click on the link, put in your email address. You will be sent two letters. These are letters that I've personally used to help get rid of collections on people's credit. And you will also be notified when the course comes out. And what do you guys, I mean, how does that, how does that go down? You guys, you're sitting there at your station and suddenly the, you, your, you know, the radio goes off. It goes down or, like clockwork. You know. It goes down like clockwork, man. They had it down where every shift change at one between 1.45 p.m., 1.50 p.m., 2.05 or 2.10 p.m., like clockwork on the level four GP yard. That's the highest maximum general population yard. You would hear the you would hear the observation tower yell, get down, get down. And the inmates are supposed to get down at that point. You know, you scan, you look real quick and you see them right in front of the building stabbing. Boom, boom. Two dudes on one guy just. You know, there, murders do happen often, uh, especially now. Right. And uh, the crazy thing is, is we're supposed to go run over there. We're yelling, get down. They they are not going to get down. 
Let me tell you that. You're pepper spraying right. <laughs> you're pepper spraying them in the face, and that pepper spray hurts, man. We we at the academy we have to get pepper sprayed to, to feel it, the effects. Right. They they're drenched. Well, first of all, they're drenched in blood from the victim. And right. all three combatants are drenched, soaked, man, like the movie Carrie. Uh, drenched in blood. You're pepper spraying them in the face. Nothing. Not not even slowing down one bit. You're hitting them with the baton. Nothing. Not even slowing down one bit. You throw the grenades. The grenades are like pepper spray or pepper spray pow that's powdered. You know, they vary. And they get poof, like a like a powdered donut. Nah. They are they are gonna stop when they are ready to stop. Or when we pull out the mini 14, the lethal rifle cha uh, chambered in 223. And um, sometimes they'll go all the way until they actually get shot by the observation gunner. What happens to got to to the inmates that you know they end up stabbing or killing somebody? They get recharged. Do they always get recharged? Like if you got a life sentence, are they recharging they, you? They are. They are recharging you, right? So like on the scene, what it looks like is it's a bloody mess. Medical responds immediately. Uh, they come from a little clinic on the yard. They, they bring all their little high-tech oxygen masks. They start plugging holes. There's holes all over the body. Um, you know, collapsed lungs. You, dude's gasping for air. Um, then we immediately handcuff everybody and everybody in the near area with either with, with mechanical handcuffs like the police carry or flex cuffs, you know, the um, plastic flex cuffs, zip ties. Start zip tying everybody. Yeah. We start... We, we start taking photographs of the evidence that you, you mentioned, do they get charged again? Yeah, this is crime scene, uh, crime scene evidence preservation. So you got to ensure that the crime scene is good for the district attorney to pick it up. You're going to have pictures of the weapons on the floor and pictures of the suspects, you know, with blood on their hands and all over their body. Uh, pictures of the victim, pictures of uh, rounds that have made been fired by the uh, gunners. Um, so all this is documentation, man. There's a whole method behind the madness. And then, yeah, at the local level, you know, because I, I eventually ended up promoting all the way up to the rank of lieutenant. So I was a correctional officer, a correctional sergeant, and a correctional lieutenant at the end of my career. Um, every little every little position has their own, every position has their own duties. Um, and as a lieutenant, you're going to place them in the administrative segregation, ad seg, the whole, the whole, you know, isolation. So that requires you to type up a, a, a ASU placement notice stating, hey, such and such inmate blank. On this day, you were observed in conjunction with inmate so-and-so attempting to murder inmate so-and-so. You are now being placed in the administrative segregation unit. And that's, you know, that's part of their rights. They got to know why they're being isolated. So. I mean, once they're like locked up and everything, do you ever find out why these things happened or they just basically, I ain't telling you nothing. No, but you don't know. You just know these two guys jumped on the guy. Do you guys ever do like an investigation where somebody eventually they find out like, do other inmates come forward and say, listen, this is what it was all about. Of, that guy took the other guy's tennis shoes. All of, you know? all of the above, man. All of the above. Every scenario, you just played it out. And I, I told you the times have changed now from 2024 to the year 2006. 2006 was more gear oriented towards crime fighting, fighting crime, cops and robbers, good guys and bad guys, so to say. Um, we studied, we studied our enemy, so to say, right? We, we observed them. It, it was a huge game of cat and mouse. We knew their tactics. We knew their coded words, their coded letters. Um, it's kind of thrilling and thrilling to, to be playing that game of cat and mouse. So we were... The majority of the time ahead of the game. Okay. There was times where we would know, hey, that dude right there is gonna get stabbed. Right. And and it varies. It varies. You can go up to that inmate or put have him escorted to the sergeant's office and say, Hey man, we have information that you were possibly gonna be the victim of a stabbing. You have to understand their mentality is like, nah, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Cause they in their head they think they're good. Um mm -hmm. You're not good. You owe somebody three hundred dollars and and two bags of potato Correct. chips, and they're going to stab you in the next two or three days. Facts. Facts. So we would make them sign uh, chronos, uh, like um, a form saying, "Hey, you stated you don't have any safety or enemy concerns, right? We interviewed you. It's kind of to cover our own ass. 
and then they go back out to the yard and then they get fucking brutally stabbed. Yeah. It in in uh Coleman they called it a strong man agreement. Where, you know, I'm sure it's got a code, but the the guys they were like, well, you know, we have to sign it say, saying we we let you know and you're saying no, you're good. I can handle whatever that comes right. my way. And it's like, a, I'm a strong man. I'm going back out there. Oh, boy. We call them marriage chronos. Like they're not going to yeah, walk Yeah, we call out. them marriage chronos or same thing, same chronos stating that, hey, you, you think you're good. Man, you're good. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's why if somebody that doesn't understand how the prison system works, it's be like, well, if you know he's going to get stabbed, why can't you prevent it? You cannot prevent what's going to happen. Uh, um, right. So... It's, it's life. If the FBI comes in and says, look, we got, we, we think that somebody's going to blow you up. Like, or we think someone's, these guys are, we heard overheard. And you're like, what do you, I'm not, like, they can't Correct. arrest you. They can't force you to go into Facts. witness protection and move you. It's like, a, yeah. Yeah. No. For us to put an inmate in isolation, that would be seen as like retaliation or he can sue us. Now there are times where the valid, validity, 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 validity of the information or there's numerous sources of course we're going to act because hey man we are no we're not giving you the option you literally have safety concerns you just don't know it yet um right so do 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 inmates i mean i already know this in federal prison but do the ever, inmates ever come and say look man i need to check <sighs> in i got some issues 2024 man <laughs> 2024 yeah it changed the game ha the game has changed you know at one point i told you that the Criminal gang leaders were locked up. In 2014, they let them out. They let them out, man. And let me tell you, it's been a doozy. I left. I left. It's out. It's gotten out of control. Out of control. Where it's extremely unsafe. More so unsafe than your regular regular average prison. Um, you know, violence. That's easy. Right. It's you know. I will dive into that. Uh, how dangerous it's gotten. But uh, as a sergeant. When I was a sergeant, the inmates would come up to me and say, hey, Sarge, I, I got to talk to you. And I would be like, uh. like when they say that, I got to talk to you, I already knew they were going to request protective custody, PC up. But the crazy thing is, mm -hmm. they were already on a PC yard. They were already on a sensitive needs yard. So you have inmates that are PCing up from a PC yard. And the reason for that was they were accumulating drug debts and that they could not pay. So... You know, yeah. it got scandalous. It got scandalous towards the, I ended up, I did eight years at one prison that was straight gang members, which made sense. Then I did another eight years, which was more like a psych ward, which to me did not make sense. And there was no structure. And that's when you had a lot of the dudes ringing up drug debts, just doing, scan, uh, robbing people, you know, just scandalous stuff. And yeah, hey, I can't be here, Sarge. Yeah, yeah there, it's a little city. Yeah. So they're little, little world, yeah. Um, um, I, so do, do you, did you guys have inmates that routinely gave you information on what was going on? So here's what I appreciated as a staff member. I appreciated somebody giving me the heads up in an incognito way, right? Like saying a little something like, Hey man, the yard's kind of hot today. Well, you know, your ears perk up and they, they meant to tell you something like, cool, man. All right. You just give them a nod or, uh, man, you might not want to come to work tomorrow. Cool. Right. Just little subtle, <laughs> little subtle things. Right. What I did not like, I mean, a lot of the inmates are manipulative. Okay. Manipulative. It's a con, mm -hmm. it's a con game. What I did not like, especially as a supervisor was inmates coming up to me and telling me, Hey, I got some information for you. I need you to do me a favor. I'm like, hey, get the fuck out of here. Right? Because they just approached me with a, some type of tit for tat. Some type of weird, you know, uh, what do you call that? Like, um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, you're like, like you're negotiating or something. Like, I, I'll do something for you if you do something right. for me. And I would tell them straight up, I, get out of here, man. I, straight up, I, get out of here. I don't need your information. I already know what's going on. Right? And so that's what I didn't appreciate them trying to game me especially so that with me that late in the game um, i felt i took that as a sign of disrespect but let me tell you something let me add something to that it's kind of funny because even on a general population yard gp if an inmate is selling drugs on the yard and he has good business right he's, he's making good money and they're selling drugs or cell phone you know who's going to tell on him his competition 
right? His competition is going to yeah. drop a kite. They're going to write on a, on a, on a, on a letter. They're going to write on a form, a prison form where they're not going to know who it's, it's going to be anonymous. They're going to drop it in the medical box. We're going to find it. And it's going to say inmate so-and-so and inmate so-and-so building five cell 237. They have drugs and weapons and cell phones. And I heard them talking about wanting to stab an officer. <laughs> So we, as a sergeant, as a lieutenant, we get the officers and we say, let's go to this building. Let's go hit this house. Let's go search this cell. And we, yeah, when we, we hit the jackpot, we find uh, dope, drugs, cell phones, weapons. And we ask them, were you planning on hitting a cop? They're like, no. You know, you could kind of tell when somebody's lying and somebody's not. Because the truth of the matter, if they wanted to hit a cop, they're going to hit a cop, period. There's nothing stopping them. Right. So, so typically that's like his competition or somebody, maybe the guy owes that him too. money or he that owes, too. you know, I owe this yes, guy money. Man. Gotta so, get they, rid of him. so we put him in handcuffs and we send him to the administrative seg segregation. We send him to the hole. Guess what? Your competition just got removed. You just removed your competition. Now you can sprout up your business. So that's how information, right. uh, uh, the different races. So how California gets down. The inmates racially segregate themselves. And I know I know a lot of other states have a hard time believing this or understanding it, but it makes sense, man. It's for a, a, a greater safety purpose. Um, all the whites hang out in a certain area. All the Mexicans hang out in a certain area. The blacks hang out in certain tables, areas, and then the others. The others consist of any other buddy else. It's not any of those other races I just named. Um Again, dating back to 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, those, those race riots were off the hook, man. Though they were race riots. Uh, the, the Mexican popula inmate population versus the whole entire black inmate population. Sometimes kites would get dropped on other races to slam, slam their opposition, you know, lock them down so they can have more time to access weapons, metal, dope, cell phones. Um, okay. All right. So, I mean, you, at some point you, you kind of, you become a, a lieutenant. I mean, you're not still in the, you know, as a regular CO, you're like in the units, Correct. right? Sh you're shaking, shaking down cells. You're just, you know, hanging out, really just making sure that some your presence Facts. is there in case something goes wrong. You do, you do the walkthrough. Um, so you know, and then you guys count, right. obviously, uh, you know, multiple times a day, you know, everybody stands yeah. up and, you know, um, and then, so, but at some point you become a Lieutenant, like what changes, like you're not in the cell, you're not, you're not hanging out in the unit anymore. I got to say something about you count the, you count the inmates and they stand up. So when I went from my, what I call the good prison, where I did my first eight years as a correctional officer. And then I went to that other prison. That's when I got a promotion at the other one, which was closer to my home in San Diego, Donovan. And uh, a crazy story is that there was an inmate that was dead for three days in his cell, dead, decomposed, rigor mortis, the whole nine. And they managed to count that inmate <laughs> for three days. Um. So what? I mean, did the guard just not care that he wasn't standing up? That's a weird thing. You know, that's the weird thing is like we I I don't I can't even fathom that. Aside from the guard, you know, not, allegedly not counting the inmate or claiming that he was standing, <laughs> claiming that he was standing during the counts. But, you know, medical staff got in trouble because they were logging in in their in their logbook that the inmate got up every day and took his medication at the window. <laughs> yeah. No, they don't. Yeah, I was going to say. So that was a big fiasco, man. So me as a sergeant at that time, before I promote, I was like, well, this place is wild, wild. This place is weird, man. It's ups I don't know how this can possibly happen. Um, but that, that's a true story, man. Uh, my friends responded to the incident. They said when they opened the doors to that housing unit, that the smell hit them outside on the yard and that they never smelled nothing like that before, man. That the uh, coroner, the San Diego Sheriff coroner came, looked at the body and said, oh, you need to call the homicide detectives right now. Right now. So he had a cellmate 
somebody was living with that dead body in that cell for three days, didn't didn't alert nobody. The officers in the building thought it was sewer or sewage backed up that was smelling. And come to find out that the inmate cellmate was in there for murdering his own dad and living with the dead body for like uh, like two weeks or something before the police finally came and found him wrapped up in the sheet. But that, in, that inmate never got charged for a murder. He didn't. So I just thought that was for the murder of his cellmate. Yeah, did anybody get no. charged for it? So what? But it was murder. They just deemed it the dude died of natural causes and was just dead in the cell for three days. The officer got in trouble. Did not get fired, but got in trouble. You know, when you get in trouble, you get a good chunk of your paycheck taken away for a long period of time. Um, mm, okay. So that was that count. That was that dead inmate story that you you made me think of right now. Um, that caused a lot of. Uh, that caused a lot of. Uh, throughout the department a lot of training next thing you know you had captains associate wardens standing in the housing units ensuring that the officers were in fact going around counting each cell and then at another prison in california i don't know if you heard about the inmate jaime osuna he chopped off his cellmate's head his head he chopped it off throughout the night he he put a sheet i don't want to put it through no hand signals right now because it'll pop up a little thumbs up but he put yeah. a sheet up on the window so the officers couldn't see in all night long well, when they finally realized something was wrong, that whole entire cell, I mean, I've, I've seen the pictures, that whole entire cell was red with blood. Um, the head was not on the inmate's body. The body is sitting down in a seated position. The head is on the bunk behind him. You can see it right next to him. The inmate cut the guts open and strung the guts through the light fixture. Um, he chopped off his fingers. Oh made a necklace out of his body parts. And then there was pieces of the, in, the the victim's body in a sandwich. And there was like bite marks out of the sandwich. So that, that's a true story. Um, that's yeah. And this is, you know, fast forward, all kinds of weird stuff starts happening in the California Department of Corrections. Um, so as a lieutenant, the role, the role is ideally, you sit behind a desk, you sit behind a computer like this, you get a good cup of coffee, you sit there and you wait, you wait till something happens. Um, and in the meantime, you're doing, uh, you know, inmates receive write-ups, rules violation reports. We used to call them 18, 115s for, for having inmate manufactured pruno, wine, alcohol. They'll get a tattoo paraphernalia, the stabbings we talked about, uh, murders. So yeah. it is the job of the lieutenant to adjudicate the rules violation report. So basically you're like a judge in the hearing. You go based on the preponderance of the evidence. You bring in the inmate as a, get his, his testimony and then he'll make a plea. Then you interview the reporting employee, the officer, whoever wrote up the inmate. And then based on the preponderance of evidence that 51% is more likely than not, that's when you make your, um, your determination, whether he's guilty or not guilty. Um, that's one of the, duties of a lieutenant okay. i was a fair shoot i was a straight shooter you... man i was a fair dude like uh, hey sit, i'll tell sit down man talk to me and, and again i have a real keen <laughs> sense for people who's lying or not and you kind of get used to it after a while so do you also determine how long they're going to stay in the shoe what what the punishment is you do as a lieutenant you get to add more time to their sentence um during those adjudications you get to take away their privileges uh, you could take away their yard privileges. So they're not allowed to go out to the yard for 90 days or even more. Um, well, 90, 99, it's been a, it's been a minute, man. I've been away for a year. So you could take away their day room privileges. So they can't come out and sit on the tables inside of the building. You could take away, depending on what their infraction is, if it had to do with visitations, you know, their family comes and visits or their girlfriend, their wife, uh, you could take away their visiting rights. Um, so I have a question. They used to take away the TVs. Where? In the cell or in the um, day room? No, oh no, there's no TVs in the cell, bro. This is in California. <laughs> in the federal system. <laughs> the federal system, no. They got TV rooms. So you have like 100 guys or you've got maybe 75 guys. You know, there's multiple TV rooms because, like you said, of races, the different races. 
So you would have like the white guy's TV room, they called the cracker box and they would have like a little TV and you could probably fit, let's say five, five, you could probably fit 20 guys in there. And then they'd have a Spanish TV room. And then they had the, the big TV room, which was really like the black TV room. But the black guys had like three TVs and the Spanish guys also had a TV. So they really had two rooms. Um, and, you know, it's, I mean, we're talking about like a hundred guys in, in that room sitting in their chairs, watching TVs. There's no nothing in the in the cells. And uh, but, yeah, they would always say, you know, that's it. We're closing the TV rooms for for a week. And they locked the doors. It never lasted yeah. long because without those TVs, right. the inmates are such problems that goes without saying that's like like now they're in the right it's a babysitter we used to say they're right. babysitters like they trust me they're not we're getting it back in two days trust uh, me. see i never heard of that i never heard of the tv rooms and i never when you said take away their tvs just as a common sense perspective i'd be like well i would never take away something that occupies them and you know so so they don't right. cause havoc or, or do other you know crazy stuff you always hear people like, oh, they shouldn't even have TVs. I like, listen, hey, bro, you better hire more officers. Bro, so I, my whole thing since back then, I always said, give the inmates marijuana and give them Xboxes. Give it to them. <laughs> because they're going to be in their cells right. high and playing video games. We're not going to have to be fighting them outside or they're going to be fighting each other. That's the truth. Yeah. So, um, so what, what ends up, you know, happening? I mean, you become yeah. a lieutenant. And at some point, you you kind of just get um, uh, disenfranchised for with the uh, you know you know upset and like I, this is not working out or like what went wrong what what so uh, yeah or is it a series, a series of, events? of events over a period a, of time right um, you guys anybody who's not from California and is an observer looking from the outside <laughs> in will probably think what the hell has that state has gone to hell in a handbasket that's you know home of the fruit and nuts that place is. You know, and then I can see their perspective, right? But we're not all <laughs> we're not all like that here, man. Some of us have some common decency, some morals, integrity, and some values. Um, so we're not all in agreement with what has transpired. We just became victims of the system, you know. And I've gotten a grander view and perspective. Not I'm not a conspiracy theorist because I've experienced combat. I've experienced the California Department of Corrections. You know, I've seen I've seen it with my own eyes. When we got to Iraq, there was no weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> so right. in essence, man, I was a good soldier. I was a good pawn. I did as I was told every time without questions or without delay. I did that for, for the time in my military, for my time in the eight years as a correctional officer. I promoted to sergeant. I still had that mindset, wanting to do the right thing. It wasn't necessarily a crime fighter, man. I wasn't going to go in and make the inmates days. That was not my style to screw with the inmates or to, it, it was definitely a game of give and take, right? Definitely a game of spirit of the law. Hey man, I know you guys are doing this. As long as you're not making a big scene or drawing negative attention to yourselves or to us, do what you do on the down low, you know? Um, then, you know, the politics, agendas. Uh, I've never seen so many people sell their own soul as I have in the California Department of Corrections. I've never, and I'm talking about staff members in green. We wear green and the inmates wear blue. Um, mm -hmm. I've never seen so much sab self sa or sabotaging. Um, it, it, it utterly disgusted me, man, because I, I was raised right in the military by great leaders. Leaders that would eventually get killed in action in Iraq. Um, so they left a huge impression on me, how to conduct myself as a man um, and a professional. I just started seeing the higher ups violate policy, violate the, the book, policy and procedure, the law. And as a result, what they were doing was jeopardizing the safety of us, staff members and the inmates, too. So, again, like I said, I'm a straight shooter, man. If something's wrong, I'm going to say hey, that's wrong. Not only are you violating policy, but but morally and ethically, that is wrong. You could just imagine, or I don't know if you know what it's like to be in an organization where you're going against the grain. It is not, it is not, right. it is not pleasant, man. It is not pleasant. You're definitely going to feel it. They're going to retaliate against you. They're going to harass you, which is also illegal, right? So it's a system. It's a right. system. Um, but still, I don't think I'm invincible. 
I don't think I'm invincible, but I also have two feet to stand on when I feel that I'm, when it's right. Right. A few years of that, man, a horrible administration with a warden that came through, a chief deputy warden that came through. What ended up happening was those people at the top surround themselves with yes men and yes women. They want, right. they also surround themselves with idiots so they can feel like the smartest guy in the room. So basically what they have is a full pass on like every, everything. They, there is no resistance. And I had to be cautious because that was my career. Uh, I had a, I had a daughter in the year 2018. I had a, a daughter, you know, she's five years old now, I have a wife, a home. So it's my career, man. I can't just go, you know, kamikaze style. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go kamikaze and die on a hill with no foolproof plan. Right. Um, and at that point, it hadn't gotten that bad yet uh, for me to even consider leaving the department. Man, why would I leave a, a something I tried so hard and aspired to accomplish? You know, I actually thought there was hope. Well, during COVID, those administrators and managers, my bosses, superiors, started shuffling around inmates from one cell to the next, from one building to the next, from one yard, and they just spread the whole entire. You know, and inmates would go out to the hospital and they would die out there. They would die. We kept telling them, stop doing that. Stop moving these inmates around. You're making this problem drastically worse. And we were all right. experiencing it for the first time, but we were boots on the ground. Even as a lieutenant, I'm still boots on the ground. I'm still in the yard. And, of course, they would hit me with a, basically a shut up or we're going to put you under investigation for insubordination. They like to use that term a lot, insubordination. But I know what insubordination is. And I wasn't insubordinate. I was just clearly voicing my professional opinion on the matter. Right. As a subject matter expert, they weren't having none of that. Numerous inmates died at every freaking prison because it's all ran the same from the department. But uh, one, of the cam one of the straws that broke the camel's back was there was this incompetent captain. This comp incompetent captain befriended a Mexican mafia member. And personally had him transferred from one of the from High Desert State Prison, which is the most northern prison in California, down to us in San Diego. Some backdoor stuff, man. We never seen nothing like this. To have a captain be able to handpick an inmate and bring him down. Cause because they knew right. each other when he used to work up there. That's kind of shady. That's extremely shady. Not kind of. Well, this captain pretty much gave full control and power to the inmate to run the yard which doesn't even sound correct, right? Why would you give an inmate of the, to, to run the yard? I mean, you got correctional staff members right. to do that. Long story short, we foresaw something bad ha going to happen because of what the, the climate. Well, it didn't take long before that Mexican mafia member and, and his cronies stabbed two officers bad, man, in the mouth, knocked out their teeth all over. They attempted to murder these officers. Other inmates got involved. That's part of the Southern Hispanic Sureño politics that if one inmate gets involved in an altercation, every one of them is supposed to run and render aid to them. So it right. was like probably freaking at the time, probably like 50 or 80 Southern or his Hispanic inmates. Again, probably at the, when it kicked off, probably around four or five COs. So 80 versus four uh, at the jump. They took the officer's batons away. They broke the officer's face with it, crushed their face, man. I seen them at the hospital. I responded because at the time I was a public information officer. I was the right-hand man for that horrible warden and the SWAT team commander. So I was wearing two hats, man. It was extremely stressful, those positions. Well, I get a call from the, from the State Department's um, spokesperson. And she says, hey, do not make a statement to the media. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird, right? But my plate was full. I had to transfer that Mexican mafia member to another prison immediately, along with other guys that were involved. So they covered that up, or they attempted to cover that up. They covered that up. They covered up the fact that a, a captain was over familiar with a Mexican mafia member and in turn resulted in almost two staff members' death. So that didn't sit well with me, clearly. And an associate warden didn't sit well with him either. And he wrote a letter, an email, and it's on the website. It's on the Google. If you Google it, warden sends blistering email in California Department of Corrections. You'll see it. 
And he basically just said in an email what I just told you. Due to the in, due to the right. incompl- incompetence, the egotistical, narcissistic management that refuses to listen to anybody, this blood is on your hands. Well, I get a call from that same spokesperson lady from our headquarters. So our headquarters from California Department of Corrections is in Sacramento. It's based out of Sacramento, downtown. She tells me, hey, Lieutenant, I need you to type up a letter to the news refuting refuting that AW's allegations. I said, refuting? Why would I do that? Because they didn't dawn on me yet. Right? I hadn't seen how high the corruption right. went. And I'm like, refuting? Right? So I'm sitting pondering, like, what the hell? She know what, she know what she's asking? <laughs> well, five minutes later, she sent me another email saying, hey, don't worry about it. The associate director up here already typed one out. Here it is. And when I read it, oh, I was disgusted, man. It said headquarters has full support of the administration at Donovan. All of the allegations said by that AW are unfounded and not true. And this is one day after the event. So clearly there was no investigation. Right. So that's when I realized, like, man, the the whole system's corrupt. The system is corrupt from the top down. Like, I'm getting the hell out of here. Right? I'm jumping ship. There's no way I can't. I can't. I can't beat a, mach- a machine, a system. So explain to my wife. Explain my dad. I ran it by my dad. You know, I was fishing for information. I threw it out there. I said, "Hey, dad, how much are you making in retire- retirement?" Because he had already retired. And he said, "Oh, this much money a month." I'm like, "Oh, because I'm thinking about retiring." He's like, "Don't do it. Don't do it." You know how those old school dads are. They, they don't want, you know, it's such a drastic change of lifestyle. Yeah. But I ended up asking my father-in-law, my wife's father. I said, hey, uh, sir, you know, I'm thinking about leaving my job. He's like, hey, man, if that's going to make you happy, you know, I'm back and you go for it. And, I, and that's all I needed. You know, that's all I needed. Not that I needed any anything to, to make me make that decision. But I'm like, all right, this dude trusts me. It's full trust with his daughter and with his granddaughter. Like, I'm sad. I felt okay with it. Um, one thing I forgot to mention too is one of the policies that they made, the administration I'm talking about, was mixing sensitive needs yards inmates, PC inmates, with general population inmates. Oh, that's a mistake. So basically mixing sex offenders, uh, rats, informants, gang dropouts with general population inmates. And what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Well, they have. So people are getting smashed. They're just walking in there and just, so I'm on a yard. They just threw me in a, in a, I think the only way you would think that that could be possibly be semi safe. If, if you took the, the GP population only a few of them at a time and put them on the PC, because then maybe there's, they're so outnumbered, they don't do anything, but the hardcore guys are going to walk up and just start smashing people. Everybody was getting smashed every which way. Everybody was getting right. smashed every which way. So yeah, every, it was horrible. It was bad. We were feeding, you know, and again, again, it comes down to all ethics, right? Ethics. Is that ethically right? No, I don't think so. That's not ethically right, man. If we know they're going to kill each other and we're purposely putting them there because you're pushing an agenda coming down from the governor. No, man. You No. Right. And on top of that, they were blaming us. <laughs> the top of that, they were blaming the lonely correction officer at the bottom of the totem pole and washing their own hands clean with what was transpiring. I'm like, no way. Absolutely not. This is not going to happen on my watch. Yeah. I was going to say, I remember in maybe it was 2000. 10 maybe 11 or 12 there was like a mandate from the bureau of prisons right the federal bureau of prisons where they said there can't be any more segregation so inmates can't choose not to go in a cell like if you're a white guy you can't say i'm not gonna sell with a black guy you know you can't you can't do it they go where they're told listen that didn't last long at all like yeah so it's like you 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 only need (laughs) four or five, six guys to get really, really hurt. And they're like, it doesn't make sense. Like, like nobody thinks like the inmate, it's not like the inmates were complaining. The inmates do this to themselves. They segregate themselves for, 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 for the purpose of safety. You know, even if you're not in danger in that environment, it's such a hostile, 
um, anxiety ridden environment, there's so much stress, you tend to gravitate toward your own kind, Facts. you know, even though that's probably not even popular to no, say right now, truth. but you feel it's just the truth. Like you feel you're going to gravitate towards the people that you feel you have the most common and that will look out Facts. for you. So, um, but you know, it's like the, at some point the administration was like, this isn't right. Uh, we can't have segregation. You're, yeah, but they're doing it to themselves. It's not like the, it, it's not like the, sec, like the, the bureau wasn't right. doing it. The bureau's trying to undo it and they don't, and then it took them, whatever, it only took a few months before they realized, yeah, we can't, we can't do right. this. These guys are going to, they're killing each other. We're, people are getting hurt. Like you stop, stop. If that's what they want, then. Right. But you know, how many people, how many guys had to get hurt before that happened? Like these inmates are, what they don't understand is it's like, Oh, well you stabbed somebody over. He took your, he took two books from you and then didn't return them and then ended up getting stabbed. Like they stabbed each other over a book. Listen, these guys can't sue. They don't each have other. anything. You know, they don't have anything. That's other it. Than books and pride. Right. Right. So, that, right. And that's it. So it becomes so overly important. Like the idea that you would stab someone over a small debt or he owes me two bags of potato chips and a, and a six pack of Pepsi. Like, it's like, that's just stupid. No, no. Listen, because if he doesn't, now everybody thinks I can Facts. take from him. It's, it's, you know, but see, if you're in the administration or even a regular citizen, it just doesn't make sense. Cause it doesn't make it, it you know, to, to a normal person, it's just like, that's insane. But, You've never been in that environment, so you don't really know. It does seem insane. Because, bro, I tell you right now, you can come in my kitchen, you can take a six yeah. pack of soda and two bags of potato chips, and I'm gonna be like, "Yeah, you got, it. you're good." But you know why though? You hit, like, you hit the nail that. on the head. It's perception. It's perception, right? And the, it's a predatorial world. Victims will not survive. So if somebody goes to your house and takes your chips, you're good because you're not feeling the pressure that, like, man, if I don't do something, I'm gonna get punked myself. And I'm the same right. way, man. You gonna go ahead, like go ahead, man. I got nothing. To, actually, now at this point, I got nothing to prove to nobody, man. I'm tired. <laughs> right. Well, and you can always call the cops. Right. I can file a lawsuit. I have so many right. remedies. I can, you know, whatever. <laughs> there's tons of remedies, but there's only one remedy in that situation: Facts, violence, extreme violence. Yeah. Um, no, it's the truth. And you mentioned um, how much violence went on, how much people got hurt. I'm not proud to say it, but I participated in that violence. When we mix those general population inmates and sensitive needs yard inmates on our minimum dorm level one, there was probably like 200 inmates in each dorm, and there was two dorms. Although I was a lieutenant by rank, I was still on the crisis response team, right? It's a SWAT team. So imagine that, man. We were set up hiding in the visiting room because we knew it was going to kick off. So, yeah, we when they escorted those inmates from R&R, &R, which is receiving and releasing, they just got off the bus. When it kicked off, I responded with the rest of the team, and I shot one inmate, pff, man, one inmate like six times in the leg, starting at the ankle all the way up. Boom, 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 boom. And again, man, I'm older now. You know, I have experience. It wasn't the first time I used a 40 millimeter, less lethal. It's a, it's a sponge round. It's kind of like a nerf, and it comes out hard. It can kill you. It w I have seen the 40 millimeter kill an inmate that got struck in the head. I've seen it because of the vel right. velocity. Um, and when that happened, you would assume, you would assume the whole entire place would go on lockdown and people would go to the hole, right? Well, let me tell you what happened. We zip tied everybody. The management was outside. We escorted, well, not, I stayed inside the dorm. They escorted the inmates out to the basketball courts. They told the inmates this, look, we're gonna cut off your flex cuffs, your plastic restraints. We're gonna escort you back in the building and we're gonna keep doing this all night long until you guys get tired. And when I heard that and my friend heard that, he goes, hey, what did they just tell those guys out there? And said that we're going to, I said, this is stupid, man. This is dumb. This is wrong. Um, and they, they kicked it off one more time. They kicked it off one more time. They're getting shot up. They're getting, you know. And finally, we forced them. We forced their hand to live amongst it. That, that's all bad, bro. That's all wrong. Um, it's a miracle nobody got killed. Yeah, because it's... I was going to say, so, so what you forced them to two weeks right. later, it could pop off again. Like you're not going to be able right. to be there to maintain that peace for all. And the that's time. what was happening. You, the guards are just so, 
They're just so out. And that's what was happening. People don't realize. Yeah, and to me, man, that to yeah. me, that's not honorable, right? I don't feel like I got a notch on my belt or did anything honorable. Like that, that to me, that's not cool, man. So you asked me, what did it take? It took numerous, numerous experiences like that. And one day, December 1st, 2022, I didn't even pick that day, man. I didn't even, I just walked in and my, Coworkers started talking to me. I didn't like the way the conversation was going. And uh, I said, you know what? Today's a day. I'm out of here. I typed up my letter of resignation. I walked up right up to the warden. The warden happened to be outside the building I was in. And uh, I said, here, sir. I actually knew the warden because he used to be my sergeant at the other prison. And now he had just gotten a new promotion as a warden at, at the other prison I was at. He didn't try to stop me. He didn't try to say, hey, what can we do? Is everything okay? He just looked. said, all right, man, good luck. Shook my hand. <laughs> and this is after I gave 16 years to the state, you know? I didn't, I didn't want to go out like this, but at least I went out on my own terms. You know, I walked out the front door with my head up high, my shoulders back. You know, I was not under an investigation. Um, turned in my ID, came home and told my wife I quit my job. She's like, well, you did, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I told you I was going to quit my job. She's like, yeah, but you didn't say today. I'm like, hey, I can't, you know, when it's time to pull the trigger, I can't call it. And um, December 1st, 2022, I chose my mental health, my family over a paycheck, over a corrupt, corrupt department. And since then, you know, I've been, I started my own YouTube channel and I've just been, <laughs> I've been singing like a canary if you have you ask me, man, but I've just been, you know, giving my experiences uh, throughout the years. So I have a, a question. Are you guys a union? Do you have a union? So the union is in bed with the department. The union is in bed with the right. governor. And I'll be at, you know, whatever rank you're at, whatever position you're at, in my, from my experience, you're only limited to what you see in that rank, what's in front of you, right? The higher I climbed up the ranks, I got exposed to more. When I made lieutenant, I got exposed to a lot, right? Being out now for a little over a year, the union is definitely in bed with the governor. Definitely in bed. Yeah, I was going to say, so it, it's funny because... You realize after talking to the officers and noticing, you know, I, listen, I was there. I was locked up for wow. 13 years. So you're sitting there going, this guy's an idiot. Like you're, you're taught, you're, you're like, how, how does this guy, how is this guy a, a lieutenant or a captain? Or like, he's, he's, he's nowhere sharp enough to have this, to be making these kinds of decisions. Right. And so what you end up finding out, or this person's a counselor, or this person's a unit manager. What you end up finding out and this and the other, the, the COs would tell you this, they'd say, so, and I'd be like, you know, my counselor's an idiot. And they'd go, oh, yeah, I know they go, they go, well, you understand, you know how she got that position. It's like, no, well, she was kicked out of this prison for this kicked out of this. Oh like, my goodness. You're such a shitty officer. They can't fire you. And he, he would say they can't really fire them. So what they do is they offer them a another position at another prison to get rid of Facts. them. And, and, and I, right. And they said, now usually they'll say, Hey, we'd like to transfer you. And they say, no, I don't want to be transferred. They're like, we're not um, asking you because what they cannot turn down. What they can't turn down is Facts. a promotion. So if they say, okay, well, we're promoting you to a counselor position and they're like, and it's, you know, whatever it's five States away. He's like, they can resign or they can take the, they can take the position. So they have to, he goes, well, then they get there and they're just as incompetent in that position. So that lasts three or four years. And there's the administration, the loot, the, um, captains or the wardens is so frustrated with this person. They get so many complaints and they've failed so many times at different assignments. They're like, you know what? Unit manager, there's a unit manager <laughs> position opening up in such and such, make them a unit manager. Listen, before you know it. They're a lieutenant, they're a captain, or they're whatever. So I remember we used to always say, like, so for you to be a warden at a prison, you've got to be almost completely in facts to, to be moved all the way up. And it was funny, we had this one, um, the assistant warden, 
And, and, and as far as corruption is concerned, listen to this. You know, the, the buildings are falling yep. apart. Okay. And so, first of all, Coleman, I'll give you an example. Coleman is surrounded by woods. And what happens is, you know, those woods, what people don't realize about woods is woods, not only do they grow, but if you trim a, a tree line, within a few years, it's overgrown. It, it starts creeping in towards the prison again, right? Like those, the trees start spouting up again. The limbs start growing in. They have to be trimmed. They, the, I, I had a buddy who worked for the, for the assistant warden. And he told me when the assistant warden got moved, she was like, look, these, there's a bunch of stuff that hasn't been done. So she called, well, all this stuff needs to be trimmed. So she started calling the tree trimming companies in the area. These guys are like, oh yeah, the prison. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll do it as soon as you guys pay me the $23,000 you owe me from six years ago when you didn't pay me before. And this is over and over. Like he said, she had to call like three or four people before somebody said, I'll do it but you, I, you have to pay wow. it. Like that check has to clear. They're like, oh, well, we need 90 days. Oh, you better order the funds now. I'll see you in 90 right. days. It was that bad. Another thing was, now after she'd been do, doing it a year or two, he said, she's kind of figuring out the game. The buildings are falling apart. So I forget which hurricane came through in, I want to say 2000, maybe it was 16 or 17, I forget. He said, after the hurricane came through, she was walking through the buildings with a camera taking photos of leaks that had been the leaks had been there for years there drywalls hanging down there's leaks that have been there for years they're taking photos of it and she's like yep she's like so this she said so this just happened huh to to him and he's like no nah, that's been there for two or three years and she go she'd turn around to the assistant and say just happened. They noticed it that the, the morning after the Whoa. storm. So they were getting FEMA funds <clears throat> to repair the prison. And he was like, Oh, they got a couple hundred thousand dollars from FEMA to fix all of these, to fix all the roofs of the prison. That's not what FEMA that like, this has been here. You're supposed to have a fund to pay that, but they don't. They piss through the money. They, they lie to the inmates all the time. We don't have any more microwaves. And then you have another inmate who's like, I, li I work in the warehouse. We got 25 microwaves right. boxes. We do have microwaves. So we can get you another microwave. You guys got to keep writing. There's well, they of pocket money. the money. They embezzle and, the money. And then a lot of them get caught. Right. Or they, yeah, I was going to say, they. it's funny. One guy who was at another prison who he was like, it's so funny because the shipments would come in for the um for the kitchen and he'd be like those four boxes go in the kitchen those two boxes go in the back of my car wow. and the, the guy running the place had opened a restaurant see what i mean and he's funding he's funding his restaurant supplying his restaurant with stuff he's ordering now in the bureau of prison they try to get rid of that they went to like a national <laughs> menu but it was still happening and they you know they can't you're just not going to beat these people at their own game yeah you know? that's their game and I wanted nothing to do with it. You know, even though I'm a free man now, I still worry. I still worry. Like, I don't trust them. They're capable of anything. Yeah. Oh, I, I yeah, I was going to say, I had a, I've had a couple of prison guards on here. I had another guy who was a, he was like, he was actually, I mean, he was a, in a this was in a jail. So this was a, he was a sheriff's deputy, but he was also in the military. And he was supposed to be able to, to, they knew when they hired him, he's, I'm in the guard. When they call me, like I have to go for the weekend or whatever. And then they would call him. They go, no, you can't, you can't get leave. He goes, no, no, I, I can get leave. I fed my, I, it, it supersedes Correct. anything. Well, we don't have anybody to cover your, your shift. He's like, well, then you get Correct. somebody or you cover it. You're the Lieutenant. You know, you, I have to go. Well, you need to call somebody. I'm yeah, I am. I'm calling you. I'm not going to be here on, on Saturday. Like. You know, and so eventually it happened like the He said like the third time it happened, they like wrote him up for lying oh. to them. Like there was a huge investigation where he's because he was at home. He said, so what happened was he went, he turned himself in on Saturday and they were like the what the the whatever it was has been postponed. But we may still do it. He's like, well, what do I do? He said, they said, go home because you may be called back in a couple hours. Right. He said, okay, called the next morning. 
and said, Hey, what's going on? They said, look, we're, we still may be doing it. So stay at home. It might, you may get a call. He said he didn't get a call. He went to work the next day, but somehow or another, they knew like, Oh, he, he went to work and I think he told them, I think he was like, yeah, you never happened. Like they had me sitting at home right. the whole weekend or I could have pissed me off. I could have come here. I could have. And they were like, Oh, he's sitting at wow. home. Yeah. And so they wrote him up saying he never went. He's like, no, no, I did right. go. I was on call. I had to be home and didn't matter. They pushed it all the way through. Eventually it got dropped. But in the meantime, they put him on unpaid yep. leave. They invest under investigation. Like, and he said it was all because he had an, an issue with uh, this one like lieutenant, this female lieutenant who didn't like him. And it was, uh, it was just a whole retaliation, thing. man. I've never seen anything more toxic. It's like, the, it's like the show Game of Thrones, man. It's really, it's cutthroat. It's cutthroat. Right. It's bad. It's awful. <laughs> so what are you, so you're doing, you're doing YouTube. Yeah. Now. Are you going to try? I mean, what about like now you've got a, a chunk of experience. You've got military. Yes. You've got working for the state in a law enforcement capacity. Right. I'm assuming that's what it would yeah. fall under. I can't imagine what else it would fall under. Um, you know, you've got administration. Like I would think you could get a job as a, as a sheriff's deputy or something. Although in California, I'm not sure I'd want that job. Either. Yeah, I'm definitely done working for the man, bro. I'm done working for the man, bro. I did that for 20 years, you know? <laughs> Um, got the YouTube going. I did write a book prior to my departure of the prison system, pretty much schooling all these youngsters, uh, you know, tips and tricks along the ways of how things used to be, you know, respect, integrity, uh, safety, pat downs, searches and stuff like that. Listen, my buddy, um, who actually just got out of prison was talking about being in there during COVID. Cause I left literally. Oh six about eight months before covid so um he was telling me like almost all of the officers yep. quit he said the most senior officer at coleman was had uh, i think two or three years experience he's like three years experience he's the most senior officer out of however 40 guys that are working the you know working uh, with 1800 inmates there's 40 cops on duty you know, including, including, listen, that's including like medical staff, the whole thing. And he was like, and the most senior person has maybe three years experience. Like after three years, you're not, you don't know all the tricks. These guys, these guys are playing not even five years, not even six years and then things change. So it's just constant. You're constantly learning. Yeah. And then he said like, they dated a sweep one time and they got like 150 phones off of his like a hundred. Like when I was there, I was like, I bet you there wasn't five phones in the whole compound. He was like, oh, it's, listen, he's like, they're hiring these COs. They're getting paid $32,000 a year. He's like, why wouldn't they bring in a phone for a grand? Why wouldn't they bring in, you know, like, he's like, they got nothing to lose. They, you've been on the job a year right. or two. Like at this point, if I, if I get fired, like, what does it matter? Like I have nothing invested at this point. Now, if you'd been locked, if it'd been 15 years and somebody said, can you bring me in a cell phone? No, bro. My pinch, I got a pension. I'm close to, you know, no, no, no. But so, yeah, he said it Let was Let me tell rough. you how bad it is right now, man. It's almost like I foresaw this happening. Go figure. Uh, in the month of January, which was last month, 2024, there was four documented inmate murders, okay? One at Pleasant Valley Prison, one at Sentinella, one at Salinas Valley, and then High Desert State Prison. One inmate was attempting to murder another inmate, and the gunner shot him with the Mini-14 and killed him. Um at Sierra Conservation Center, SCC, it, it is uh, an inmate got into the control booth where their female uh, officer was working. There's guns up there, live lethal guns. And the allegation was that she was sexually assaulted over a period of five hours. Right. This is all last month. Yesterday, yesterday morning, my phone was blowing up because people still contact me on the daily at Ironwood State Prison. A hundred Southern Hispanic inmates assaulted five staff members and sent them out to the hospital. Two of them got flown out in the helicopter. It, it is just the California Department of Corrections is on fire right now. And you have incompetent managers at the top running the department to the ground. And you have, like you mentioned, man, those young cops, those young guards, officers that don't know what they got themselves into. Don't have the experience, the life lessons. And they're getting fed to the wolves, man. They're getting destroyed by these inmates. I was going to say, um, 
when it goes bad, it goes bad so fast. <laughs> like you think you think you're prepared for it. Like to like I've been standing there just in a crowd of guys, and all of a sudden the locks start flying. The and you're like, what what just happened? I mean, like you're backing up, and there's and it's like everything was perfectly calm. We're waiting for the gate to open. There's there's a hundred guys, maybe two hundred guys, packed into a little area waiting for the guard for the gate to pop. And next thing you know, wah, 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 and everybody kind of dr- starts pulling back. But the guy's so, in so much, he's so damaged by the time he actually hits the right. ground. I remember somebody asked me one time, oh, you know, it's funny. They were asking me like, oh, what was the difference between the the medium and the low? And I was like, well, I mean, I always have this joke. I'm like, at the medium, if somebody puts a candy bar, a Snickers bar on your pillow, don't eat it. I said, at the low, you can eat it. These fuckers aren't doing nothing. But, but the thing is, at the medium there was violence was so regular that if something happened, there would be, you know, lockdown, lockdown. We all go in our cells. They close the thing we're talking about. Then they come around the count 45 minutes later, boom, they open the doors. Ciao. Like nothing. And this is somebody got stabbed. Now at the low violence was less frequent, but when it happened, like you're locked down for three days. Yeah, it's weird because it's like because I think at the low they were so they didn't know how to handle it as much, even though a lot of the guards crossed right. over, but they would keep you. But then again, I'll tell you right, at the low, you don't have cells. Yeah, it's dorm living. You know. Yeah. But these guys were so it, they weren't, you know. Funny thing is that when I was in the medium and they were gonna transfer me to the low, I did everything to try and stay at the right. medium. You know, you had your own cell, you could close a door, not your own, you I was had a bunkie, but or celly, but you know, you you close the door, you, it, it, you, you had a, at least the ability for it to be quiet. You know, you had privacy, um, that the low, you don't have any of that. Like it's, you know, from so, my experience, we have four levels here in California, level one, which is your lowest level two, level three, and level four. I preferred, and a lot of people prefer, man, COs and inmates. We all prefer level four GP. The worst of the worst reason being is because they don't bullshit, man. They're not going to sit there and talk shit to you. If they have a fucking problem with you, you're going to know it. <laughs> and it's right. all about respect. Respect is huge on those yards, man. So you're going to learn real quick as a guard or a CEO not to pop off at the mouth at an inmate because it's going to get handled. Which, by the way, is exactly the opposite of what people think. So whenever people ask you know, about the, the guards, I would say, oh, the guards at the low are the fucking right. worst. I was like the guard and they were like, what? And I go, yeah, yeah. At the low and the, and the, and the camps, I said, they'll talk to you like you're a fucking dog. Mm. I said, but as it gets to the medium <laughs> and the, and the pins, I was like, I was like, they're extremely respectful to, to the inmates. And the and guys are always like, why? And I'd say, because that inmate's got a life sentence. He's got a weapon and it doesn't change much if he ends up stabbing some guard in the right. neck. I'm like, because he's disrespectful. I said, and you're disrespectful. Then everybody, the other inmates are like, that dude's disrespecting you. You need to handle that. And now if you don't, now you've got a problem with them. Facts. So, right. And I was just like, I was like, so, but at the low or the, or at a camp, I'm like, nobody wants to leave the camp. Like you can talk to me like any way you want, bro. I don't want to leave. I work (laughs) my way down or I'm not tough enough to end up hurting somebody and go to a pen. You can't put me in a pen. Oh, no, I'm a soft as cotton. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. So, the level four. But is, it's funny. It's not- the structure is good too, man. Even the inmates, the convicts have their own codes, their own rules. You know, one of them, one of them is don't disrespect the guards, the COs. And I appreciated that. You know what I mean? Everybody's just grown or for the most part and trying to do their own thing and take it easy. Yeah. I was going to say, it's funny you mentioned like at the medium. They would, the tattoo guys would go to the guard, the, the, you know, the CO and say, Hey, listen, um, bro, I, you know, look, I tattoo, I I'd like to be able to tattoo this guy. And the guard the CO would be like, listen, the Lieutenant comes around at seven o'clock. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just saying, have your lookout. No, he's coming. Like you don't have to worry about me, but if that, if he walks by and sees you guys, they're like, no, 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 I got it, bro. I got it. I got it. And they'd be like, all right, you know. So the, the guards were like, okay, like, oh, hey, man, I run a table. I, this, that, that's fine. But the lieutenant's coming by. Yeah. If there's any problems, 
you're not going to be doing it again. No, no, there'd be no problem. That's spirit of the law. They actually teach us at the academy, man. Spirit of the law is when you cut them breaks like that. And letter of the law is when you book them by the book. So I operate off spirit right. of the law, man. That shit worked for me. It worked for me. You know, everybody's style is different. Well, I, think, I feel like it keeps the peace. Yeah. I, you know, I feel like it keeps the peace, right? Like, um, it, you know, you're, you're already in such a stressful environment to, to not give these guys some way to blow off and look, and I don't gamble. I don't do anything. Like I'm harmless, <laughs> but some of these guys, like oh, you knew, yes. they, bad, you know, bad news, man. So you got to give them something. Right. Um, cause otherwise then I gotta, t I gotta hear, then they gotta be in the unit screaming and hollering and yelling. And it's like, Oh, can't you just lay down and right. read a book? Like, you know, they don't want to, they want to go game yeah. um, or do something, but okay. So the YouTube, so what is it you do? What is the format of the YouTube channel? Uh, the format is like called what, you know, uh, you... that prison guard. And I started it a year ago and I'm already up to, I probably hit 26,000 subscribers already. So it kind of grew fast, man. A lot right. of my viewers are formerly incarcerated inmates, believe it or not current guards, the family members of guards, the family members of inmates, because I keep it unbiased, man. I just say, hey, this is how where I was and this is how it went. And a lot of people. So do you go ahead? Do you interview? I do people? interview people. Yeah, I do interview people. Um, you people reach out to me through email and we just do a sim similar like this and we just chop it up. Hey, tell me about your experiences. Um, a lot of people want to know about prison. What about Right. What about former C, uh, former CEOs or current? Okay. CEOs? Current CEOs is a big no, no man, because the department is, the department hates me right now. Right. I'm a thorn in their side yeah. to say the least. <laughs> oh, they fucking despise me, bro. Right. And all I'm doing is telling the truth at which I have documentation and facts, bro, because it would not, it would be slandering or defamation of character if I didn't have facts and documentation to prove it. Um, listen, I've got, and I got a guy, a, a former CEO that I, th I want to say he worked, I want to say it was like eight or nine years he worked in uh, Rikers Ooh. Island. You know what I'm talking about? No, but I, I've always been intrigued by Rikers Island. Well, he's worked at a couple different places, but I mean, he was, I, I can't imagine anybody more corrupt. He's bringing in, he's bringing in drugs. He's bringing, he's pimping out other female correctional uh, officers. Oh, it's, it's in, if you, if you, he's bringing in uh, alcohol, like, you know, he's like, yeah, you know, 500 bucks, I'll bring in, you know, a little bottle of alcohol. You can have some alcohol for your birthday. Like it's, he's like, I'm me. I mean, it was just blatant. Um, and he talks about, listen, he, he, matter of fact, his book was his story. Well, and he write, he wrote a book was optioned by Will Smith for like three or four years. They kept re-op re-optioning it, but Will Smith, they dropped the project after Will Smith oh. you know, started slapping, slapping people. Yeah. Um, but listen, he'll do your thing. You'd get, you know, you'd get a kick out of it. And the guy's totally open about it. He's like, oh, I would do this. I would do Damn. that. One time this happened. One time that happened. It's like you, you as an inmate, I, I, I'm like in shock. But as a CEO, you'd be like, oh, how did you get around it? And now he was doing it too, by the way. He was like, there weren't cameras everywhere at that point. Is when he was doing it, and he'll tell you the years and everything. He's like, they hadn't installed all the cameras yeah. yet. So he's like, I could go pick up an inmate, walk him over into areas where he shouldn't be. Um, and uh, and meet go into a uh he's like go into a, a storage closet and meet a, a female CO in there. Damn, hell no. Yeah, the I I yeah, I definitely didn't like dirty, corrupt COs because it became extremely dangerous for the, the good guys, right? Quote unquote. A lot of my friends. I know, but he's perfect for your channel, bro. Uh, let me give you his name. Yeah, you can you, shoot me his name you know in the email. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I've yet to interview a, a dirty, corrupt CO, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've seen a lot of my friends get Listen, beat up as a result of dirty COs. <laughs> look, I got another. Um, <laughs> I have another in another guy who was a. Um, uh, he was a CO. Listen, he has had a very well. He. That they call him the stoned sailor. A stoned sailor. I've heard that name before. Yeah. He's um and what happened was he got staph infection Oof. while on the job and it got into his spine. And 
like ate away at his spinal cord or something. And they had to go in and clean him out and everything. They told me never walk wow. again. And, um, but same thing, like he was in the military. Uh, he, he then became a CO. He was a CO for X amount of time. He's got an interesting story. He got one of those stories. You'll, you'll, you'll tear up and cry at the very end. Like he's, it's, it's a good Man. story. Um, so, uh, yeah, but, uh, I, I've got his information too. So I've got some C I got another CO. I told you the one that they did the retaliation. I got like three CEOs, yeah, yeah, send, bro, that I could get me. Yeah, send me, send them my way. Yeah. They'd be interesting, yeah. um, conversation. Sure. So yeah, I talk about, I do interviews with former inmates, no, no current CEOs, man. They will get retaliated. They'll get shit canned from the job, bro. If I were to do, you know, current, right. I believe I, I did one or two or three previous former uh, employees. Um, and, you know, it's, it's therapeutic for people. You know, they, they get to, they get to hear the changes, man. And there was a lot of convicts that actually did regular normal time in the 80s, the 90s. And the, the California Department of Corrections right now is unrecognizable, man. Uh, it, it's on, it's out of control. So, yeah, they right. love to hear the truth, man. I'm the only one speaking the truth because... I don't know if you realize or not, but uh, certain law enforcement agencies like to paint their own narrative. Everything's all. No, <laughs> no, you know? I'm not going to sit here and listen to you. <laughs> that everything's perfect. Everything's sunshines and rainbows. Everybody's getting along. Let me tell you, that's not the case. Right. I'm just showing the other side of the coin, man. Yeah. Yeah. I also have a four. I, I, I did. I have the information for a former. A, he was a former sheriff and he was hooked on oxys Oof. and he got indicted and went to prison. I seen that episode. Yeah, man, I would be interested in chopping it up with that, dude. Yeah, I did see it. Yeah, from time to time, I watch, you know, a little bit of YouTube myself and I, and I find yeah. those, in, yeah. those stories interesting. If you'll say, yeah, I mean, I, not that I, I think you're, you're hurting for guests. Like, I don't know how many people are reaching out, but those are all really yeah, interesting stories to this me. This is 2024, man. Like I said, this is my second year doing it. So I just can, can continue grinding. Yeah. And I, I was going to say, and I think you'll have a, a, a more, a more educated perspective um, of their story than I do, because I, I, I don't understand the intricacies of the job, the way you would understand. So I don't really know what to say oh, or ask or say, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like to me, I'm sitting in a cell that they walk by. I don't know what's going on, <laughs> on the other side. Yeah. I don't know how the arguments or what it took to become a CEO. Well, it's funny or, you mentioned that because since I've been out and doing the YouTube, everybody like the former inmates are like, Oh man, it's crazy to hear how you guys think what you guys do behind, you know, the, behind the, the closed doors. And I'm like, yeah, you know, this is, this is how it is. Um, Yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll shoot you cool. all those guys' information, um, and I, I'll put the link in the description box for your appreciate channel. That. Is that yeah, cool? Appreciate that. Uh, any anything? Um. Okay. You feel good? You want to wrap it up? We, yeah. We just, good, you know, my YouTube channel, that prison guard, and then I wrote that book, Operation Yard Recall oh, yeah. by Hector Bravo. That's on Amazon. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching the interview. If you liked it, do me a favor and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Also, we're going to leave Hector's links for his channel and his book in the description box. So the link will be there. Just click it, go on over, hit uh, subscribe. Also, do me a favor and please consider joining my Patreon. And hey, this is Matt Cox and I'm uh, I'm putting out a credit course. Uh, the course is going to be designed to build, to repair credit, but more so also to, uh, to build credit, which is where my strengths lie. Obviously I've, you know, illegally created over 50 or 60, uh, identities, uh, through, uh, creating synthetic, uh, profiles. Uh, I've borrowed, I don't know, the, uh, FBI, uh, said it was around $55 million. I've, I went to prison for 13 years for doing exactly that. I've owned a financial institution and I've worked hand in hand with the owners of financial institutions as well as underwriters. So I know what happens and what, what the banks and financial institutions are looking for on the back end. And I'm, that's really where my strengths lie and how I'm going to 
create this course in order to help you legally build your credit so that you can borrow, have as much borrowing capacity as is legally possible. If you're interested in the course, go to the description box, click on the link, put in your email address. You will be sent two letters. One is a letter requesting information for collections on your credit. The other one is a letter disputing those collections. These are letters that I've personally used to help get rid of, uh, get rid of um, collections on people's credit. And you will also be notified when the course comes out. The first letter is designed to request information on any collection that shows up on your credit. Now, once you receive that information, the second letter is designed to dispute that information that has been sent to you for the collection. By using these two letters, typically you're able to, to get rid of any collection that is on your credit. So listen, the first letter that you're gonna get is it, basically that letter is designed to dispute any collection that shows up on your credit, right? So you've got, uh, you pull your credit, which we're gonna get into, you know, you pull your, you get your free annual credit report, you get it, we're gonna explain how to kind of look at it deter and determine uh, what collections need to be removed. Uh, so you're gonna take a look at that, you're gonna find those collections and then this letter is to is it's set up so that you can request information from the collection company about the actual debt, outstanding debt. Uh, what's interesting is that you'd be shocked how many of these companies can't provide much of anything. They typically, and I mean when I I, I mean like ninety five percent of the time, they can't provide any contracts. They can't provide um, anything that you've signed. Typically what they've got is they purchased or were assigned a debt from you know, a hospital, a phone bill, uh, maybe a, some kind of a phone, uh, you know, a cellular company or a, a utility or maybe it's even a credit card company. And all they really get is your name, some very basic information that says that you owe this debt. So what happens when you go back to them and you say, listen, this is an $1,100 debt that I don't believe I owe. And I'd like to know what information you have that proves that I owe this debt. You're not actually denying that you owe the debt. You're just saying, I don't believe that this is, I don't think you have the information. I, I don't really think that, that this may even be me. Maybe it's not me. Why do you think it's me? Now, typically they can't send you anything. So of course, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this letter, you're gonna fill it out with the information, you're gonna mail it in, you're gonna get a certified, you wanna get a, a certified uh, you know, um, return receipt. Because if they don't respond, when you go to, if they never send you anything, and sometimes that happens, if you have the certified receipt, they signed for it, they just didn't respond. Okay, now they're, they're breaking, now they're, I don't wanna say they're breaking the law, but they're, they're now not following procedure. So it should be very easy to get that collection taken off of your credit report. But let's say, so what you do is now you say, hey, look, I sent them the letter. Here's the letter I sent. They, they signed for it. They never responded. Now you can send that to the credit bureaus. The credit bureaus now have to do an investigation. And if they can't prove that they did send you the information, then they'll take it off your credit. And that's one way. What if they do respond? What if you send them that letter and they send you some very basic information? Typically, like I said, 95% of the time, you're gonna get one or two pages that are, it's a printout. Now, so the second letter is designed for you to dispute that, which is saying, one, I don't see anywhere that this says that this is me that took this debt out. You know, this may have been a, it may be a case of a stolen identity or, you know, uh, it may be identity theft. It may be a mistake. I don't see where you have my driver's license, my information, my, my social security number, my date of birth, my signature. I don't see where you have a contract where I signed. So you'll then dispute it again using the second letter explaining all of that. Now they have a certain period of time. Obviously, once again, you want a certified receipt. You'll send in that receipt, or you'll, sorry, you'll, you'll receive that receipt knowing that they received it. And if they can't then come up with any of that information, you can then go to the um, credit bureaus and say, listen, 
this is what they sent. This is what I sent them in response. This is a letter. They received the letter and they were never able to come up with anything that said I owe this debt. Now, if those two things don't work, there is a third option and we'll get into that in the course, obviously. But a lot of times these two letters on their own will work. 